Good morning, sir. Uh, okay, start it. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Prince Manu, Roshan Kanan. I think the others will join us as we get started. Um, let's uh, pray together. I take a minute just to pray, and then we will get started with this course, uh, BC 303, our uh, book study on the book of Romans. All right, so um, let's just pray together. Could one of us uh, please unmute our mics, and then we'll pray, and we'll get started. Sure, Pastor. Uh, Father, we submit this day into your hands. We submit this session into your hands. We thank you, Lord, for this provision that you uh, made for us, Lord, to learn from your word. Father, even as we, uh, Lord, humble ourselves and, um, and learn, Father, Lord, from your word, Jesus, let the word minister to us, equip us, empower us, Jesus. We know these words are alive because you are alive. And so we thank you, Father, Lord, for this privilege and an honor to learn from word father lord i pray that the session will empower us jesus and we submit this the rest of the course into your hands lord uh let it be a blessing i pray in jesus name amen 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 thank you russian and uh welcome everyone um so this course is a study on the book of romans um and we have um uh, we will be releasing the course notes, you know, chapter by chapter as we go along. Uh, uh, this will be put up in the coursework section in the Google Classroom, so you could download the PDFs uh, from there and um, follow along. So there are three PDFs put out there already, uh, and uh, we'll just, you know, quickly look at the introduction. Uh, to this, uh, to the book of Romans, and then get started uh, chapter by chapter. Now, uh, this third year, uh, in the third year, like uh, we mentioned earlier yesterday, um, what we are uh, trying to do as we uh, equip our students is to uh, give a lot more practical input on the ministry areas whether it's local church or worship ministry or youth or children or administration or media and technology, and a lot of practical things that you need if you're going to be leading or involved actively in church or Christian ministry. But at the same time, we want to delve into a little more deeper study of things. So uh, first two years has been a lot of topical you know, been covering different topics, and those topics are important uh, because uh, you know you need we need to have a a broad understanding of things in the ministry because we're going to face all kinds of things. So there's a broad array of topics that we covered in the first two years. In the third year, we are going into the uh, books of the Bible, primarily the New Testament. You know, so a, a lot of the studies would be covering. New Testament books, some, I think just one course does, you know, the entire, uh, when we look at Revelation and Daniel. But otherwise, we are, uh, want, we want to study book by book in the New Testament, because that's going to be the basis of a lot of our, our teaching and ministry. Now, usually when you, you know, uh, buy a new book, most of us, or even before we decide to buy a book, that we feel we are interested, at least uh, in the days when, um, you know, we used to buy physical books. Uh, I know these days, uh, many of us, you know, we buy books online, but even online books, they give us a preview. You know, you can uh, look at a summary of the book, you know, maybe uh, a preview of the book, the, the cover, of course, and then the contents a little bit, maybe of chapter one, the introduction in chapter one. Uh, when we buy physical books, you know, we usually turn to the back of the book because that gives us a little summary of the book uh, to see if we are interested. You know, it kind of highlights what does the book cover. And then maybe we may even read the introduction. Uh, or we may read a little bit, little bit about the author.
um, said I lost my connection, but okay. Can you all uh, see me? Are you all with me so far? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Okay, great. Because I got a message saying I lost connection. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, great, great. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to just give a little overview of the course and then get into the introduction to the book of Romans. If you want to understand what is this book about, um, why was it written, when was it written, and what are the key things we're going to get out of this study of the book of Romans. And then we're going to go verse by verse uh, study, right? So I'm going to share the uh, PDF, uh, PDFs that are been made available to you just so that we could all uh, um, track together and uh, you will know where what I'm uh, referring to as I am speaking. So this is just the course overview, the first document uh, that we had put out. Um, you know, it's going to be a study through the Romans. Uh, we will have three simple assessments at different points along the course, the grading structure all of you are familiar with. Um, yeah, what I would recommend, if you have time, as you read along, you know, there are lots of commentaries. Of course, you can download lots of commentaries. Uh, but uh, I would uh, encourage you to look at one of them, which is David Guzik's uh, word commentary, uh, Enduring Word. Uh, you can uh, you can look it up online, or if you're using eSword, it, you can get downloaded as part of eSword, and you can follow make use of it, just additional reading. Uh, and then notes, the PDF notes that I will give you has a lot of content already. Uh, but if you want to you know, read some more, if you have the time to do it, you're uh, welcome to look at other commentaries and resources. And one of those I would point you to is uh, uh, David Kuzik. The reasons I put to him is because he comes from a spirit-filled uh, background. Uh, um, and so he does bring in that aspect of um, understanding of the word. So that would be useful. Now, let's get into an introduction uh, to the book of Romans. Um, I uh, don't want to, you know, uh, overstate things as though the book of Romans is the, is the most important book in the New Testament. So I don't want to do that. But yet at the same time, uh, the Paul's episode, to the Romans is uh, is regarded by many as uh, uh, you know one of the best expressions of Christian doctrine. You know, the epistles, uh, as the other epistles, to whether it's Corinth, uh, Galatia, or Ephesians, or you know the prison epistles <clears throat> that Paul wrote uh, from to the Philippians, the Colossians, and so on. Uh, they are addressing certain elements of Christian life or the life of the church. They're addressing problems and those kinds of things. But the epistle to the Romans is doctrinal. It's more teaching oriented. It starts off from the very basic of the existence of God and goes through a journey of sin, salvation, uh, the gift of righteousness, the grace of God, uh, talking about uh, Christian living, and so on. So it is, it is, uh, you know, it's uh, again. Forgive me for saying it. It's the best episode when it comes to uh, Christian doctrine teaching, right? Uh, and so it, it is something very important to study to understand. And also in it, and probably the only place in the New Testament, we have about three chapters that really explain to us the relationship between the church and Israel, uh, possibly. Yeah, of course, the book of Hebrews has some of it uh, in terms of covenant, but in terms of what is God doing with Israel and with the church, you find that in the book of Romans. So again, it's very unique from that perspective, you know, because you know, the entire Old Testament is God's dealings with the people of Israel 
And then there is the pro prophecies of Christ's coming. And then suddenly you come into the New Testament and it starts off with Jesus and the church. And we wonder what happened to Israel, you know, because the whole entire Old Testament was God working with Israel. You cross over, the New Testament is about the church. What happened to Israel? So in the book of Romans, uh, Paul is very beautifully uh, bring that out uh, to us. And so that is also uh, important for us to understand. And uh, like we said, uh, many key doctrines, that means the teaching of the church is established in the book of Romans. I'm just repeating the existence of God, the issue of sin and conscience, the issue of salvation, the issue of grace, uh, the issue of righteousness uh, and the issue of Christian living and various aspects of it dealing with how does a Christian relate to others? How does a Christian relate to the government, civil government? How did the Christian relate to sin, you know, sin and uh, overcome sin? So, so all these are doctrines, meaning these are the, these are the key teachings of the church, if you will. And so all these are covered in this book. Um, uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans, right? So uh, let's get a little background of, uh, you know, what motivated the Apostle Paul to write this book? When was it written? And, uh, you know, what was some of the, um, th uh, the things Paul uh, was expecting to happen? So uh, now these dates, of course, you know, of course, we know that uh, all of this happened in the first century AD. Uh, so these dates are approximate, meaning they are reconstructed based on various pieces of information that uh, people have, you know, over time put together. And so we approximate say, you know, this was a time when uh, Paul went on his first missionary journey, when he went on a second missionary journey and third missionary journey. And so uh, this is where he would have most likely written various episodes. So these, uh, you know, these are... Uh, 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 approximate so uh, you know you may find some variations in different commentaries and so on but just keep in mind that uh, people are trying to make the best estimate of when the episode would have been written or when Paul went on his missionary journey and so on so if there are variations there by three four three or four years don't don't get worried about it uh, everybody's just trying to make their best guess based on information we are able to put together Right. So uh, what happened during Paul's uh, second missionary journey, that is around 80, 49 to 52, uh, uh, and you can see some of the places that Paul went. Uh, uh, sorry, oh, the, this map shows his third missionary journey. But in the second missionary journey, he came to Corinth, and uh, we read about this in Acts chapter 18. So he came to Corinth, and then at Corinth, he met a couple uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, what had happened around that time was um, the emperor in Rome, uh, Emperor Claudius, in, 80, in around AD 49, he had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Right? So uh, the Jews left Rome and they you know, had went back to wherever their hometowns. Uh, so Aquila and Priscilla were Jewish believers who were from Rome, and they landed up in Corinth, where Paul was ministering. And uh, so they joined with Paul, and uh, you know uh, they ministered with Paul. But remember, they were Jewish believers who were who came from Rome. So uh, this was Paul's interaction with believers from Rome. You know, he would have heard a lot about. The, what was happening in the, in Rome and so on, and he had a lot of time with Aquila and Priscilla, uh, and eventually, after uh, some time, uh, around AD 54, uh, Aquila and Priscilla went back to Rome, and there uh, they would have surely uh, spoken to the the believers at Rome about Paul, about his ministry, and so on. Now, in his third missionary journey. Uh, Paul, uh, of course, he travels, uh, uh, he spends a lot of time in Ephesus, and uh, then he comes down to Corinth uh, around AD 53 to 58, 
uh, he and uh, uh, from Corinth he writes to the believers at Rome. So this is again approximate um, around AD 57 uh, during his third missionary journey. Paul is in Corinth. From there he is writing to the believers at Rome. So how do we know that Paul must have written, you know, this epistle from Corinth? There are a few indicators there. Uh, if you, you know, if you go to Romans, the 16th chapter and the 23rd verse. Now this is uh, in the PDF, so we could just uh, look at it there. And Romans 16 and verse 23, uh, Paul mentions uh, the names of two people. Uh, he mentions the name of uh, Gaius, uh, who is very likely uh, the person who was also mentioned in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.14. And Gaius was a believer in Corinth. Uh, so he says, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. So Gaius is somebody from Corinth. We know that from 1 Corinthians 1.14. So that's one indication that, okay, Paul is staying with Gaius and he's writing from his house, uh, you know, so most likely he is writing from Corinth. Another indicator is he mentions the name of Erastus, the treasurer of the city. Right? And uh, then this is more of a piece of archaeological information, uh, Erastus is uh, we find that he is the head of the, uh, you know, what we would refer to as uh, the public works department or the people that are going to take care of uh, the city. And we see his name mentioned in Second Timothy ch chapter 4, verse 20, when Paul mentions him uh, uh, to Timothy. And we also get some archaeological confirmation of him, there, there is a, 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 a pavement or a stone that was part of a road. You know, in those days, they had these roads and they put stones just to um, make those roads. And on one of those uh, stones, this inscription, um, then and when translated, it says Erastus, uh, and they use the word uh, edilship, that means he was the official magistrate who paved this road at his own expense. So you have this piece of archaeological evidence that adds to, you know, kind of gives a little support to the fact that uh, Erastus was uh, a city official in Corinth. Paul mentions his name. So that's, an, again, a second indicator that most likely he wrote this episode to the Romans from Corinth. Um, now, some of the motivations that which led to the writing of the this letter to the Romans is that Paul, in a, towards the end of his letter to the Romans, he shares about his plan to come to Spain. So, uh, if you want to look at the map, uh, there's Jerusalem, there's Corinth, where Paul is writing. Uh, is he from in his third missionary journey? He's planning to go to Spain. He wants to go and extend the work of God's kingdom over in Spain. But he says, I want to go via Rome. So I'm planning to come to Rome on my way to Spain. So you read about that in Romans 15 and verse, verses 22 to 20, uh, 33. Uh, can somebody just read this passage for us out loud? Uh, because there are other things that we can draw from this passage. Can somebody read this for us, please? You can read it from your Bible or you can read it from the PDF, uh, whichever is uh, convenient for you. Okay, I'll, re I'll read it. Go ahead. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while, but now I'm going to Jerusalem 
to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I am when I have performed this and have sealed to them this group, I shall go by way to you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the full fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, uh, there's a lot that we can see. We can, you know, get a feel for Paul's heart for you know so he says you know for uh, many years verse 23 for many years i've been longing to come to you you know so you can imagine from uh, the time uh, he met aquila and priscilla uh, and they told him about the believers in rome and we will talk a little bit about you know how the church in rome started um but from the time he heard that, about that, and he had the time to interact with Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth, uh, till now, uh, he must have had this great desire, hey, I need to go to these believers in Rome. And, uh, uh, and we also see one of his desires was, uh, he says that in verse 29, he says, uh, when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Of Christ so you so you can see you know Paul's heart here hey I want to go to these believers and I want to bring something to them spiritually and we will when we get into chapter one uh, he expresses that again that he says you know I want to impart to you some spiritual gift so that is Paul's heart you know I, 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 I want to go to these believers who are in Rome I want to come to them in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I want to impart to them something spiritual. So he feels like he can you know, give to them spiritually. And that's his motivation in going there. You know, and for those of us who uh, like to travel and minister or who some of us may be in tra traveling ministry, you know, this is what motivates us. You know, why do you want to go to a city somewhere and minister to the believers there? What is motivating you? Uh, it's not about you know going and sightseeing. It's not about uh, you know I want to go and see uh, a place or experience the culture. You know it's not recreational, but really the motivation is I want to give them something in the spirit. Uh, I want to impart to them the full blessing of the gospel of Christ. I want to come and strengthen them spiritually. That's the motivation. That's why people travel. Uh, they go from place to place. They go to different places and minister to believers. That's the motivation. Right? But then Paul is kind of shedding a little bit of, about uh, what he's planning to do. Uh, uh, many of us know that um, uh, around that time, there was a famine in Jerusalem. There was hardship there among the believers in Jerusalem. And so... Paul had encouraged some of these churches that he had started in the region of, like he mentions here, Achaia, where Corinth was, and Macedonia, where you know um, other cities were, Philippi, and uh, so on. Uh, he's, he's encouraging those churches that he had, uh, which are on the eastern part of Europe, uh, that he had started, uh, uh, he had ministered to is encouraging them to contribute to help the saints in Jerusalem. So Paul felt it responsible, his part of his responsibility that he would take this offering, go to Jerusalem, uh, give it to the 
believers there so that you know, they will have some help. Uh, and then after that, he wanted to go to Spain, but he said, I will go through Rome and I will make my way to Spain. So that was his plan and that's what he's sharing over here. So that was Paul's motivation. Uh, in, you know, he, he longed to go and uh, minister to the believers at Rome. So now quickly, a little background. How did the church in Rome, at, how does church at Rome start? Who would have started that church? Uh, what we do know is this, that on the day of Pentecost, there were visitors from Rome, right? So this is in Acts chapter 2. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, um, there were Jewish people from various parts of Asia and around Asia and Europe who had come to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the feasts. You know, and they would come sometimes for a period of 60 days, right? They would uh, start off with the celebration uh, of uh, the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread or even the Feast of Passover. They would go into the, the Feast of First Fruits, which was three days later. Then they would stay on till Pentecost, which was another 50 days later. So for you know a good 60 days, uh, they would be in Jerusalem. And so we, there were Jewish people who came uh, to J Jerusalem at that time. And we see recorded for us here in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, that there were visitors from Rome and they were both Jews and proselytes. That means they were Jewish people and they were Gentiles who had embraced Judaism. So they are referred to as proselytes. as They were all there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So we can just imagine that some of these Jews who had come from Rome were impacted on the day of Pentecost. They were touched and they stayed in Jerusalem for a good period of time to uh, learn from the apostles and uh, who stayed under the apostles teaching and doctrine. And then there was a mix of uh, Jews and Gentile believers there. And then eventually, uh, after some time, they would have gone back to Rome. But they would have been impacted on the day of Pentecost. They would have stayed for some time under the teaching of the apostles in Jerusalem. And gradually, they would have gone, to Rome, gone back to Rome. So that is how the church at Rome got started. We don't have the mention of any leader in the church at Rome. Uh, we don't have, you know, a founding apostle going there to start that church. All we know is it must have been these believers, Jewish people, Jewish and Gentile proselytes on the day of Pentecost who are affected by um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and what happened from that day, who eventually went back to Rome and they continued in the faith. So we could say that the church in Rome was a spirit-filled church because, hey, these people were there on the day of Pentecost. And uh, we could say that these believers in Rome were people who, you know, received the teaching of the apostles. Uh, they were established in what the apostles taught them. So you can... Imagine the apostles would have taught them the Beatitudes, they were taught them uh, you know, the teachings of Jesus, uh, they were taught them about the end times, they were taught everything that we read in the Gospels that have been imparted to these believers through the apostles. The apostles would have told them all about all the miracles Jesus did, and he'd have told them about you know uh, uh, the great commission that Jesus gave us as people. As, as his disciples to go and make disciples. So all this would have been imparted by the apostles to these believers, Jews and Gentiles. And then eventually they would go back to Rome and then they do the work. So these unnamed believers would have spread the gospel at Rome. And uh, what we know is that 
it was a mixed group of Jews and Gentile believers, and that the church must have multiplied. There must have been several house churches at Rome. We can say that because in Romans 16, Paul mentions that. He says, you know, in Romans 16, verses 3 to 5, uh, could somebody read that for us, please? Go ahead. Jesus sent Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own nest for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the, of the Gentiles, likewise greet the church that is in their house, greet my beloved Ephesus, who is the first group of Asia to Christ. Okay, so he's Paul when he's writing to the believers in Rome. He says, "Hey, greet Aquila and Priscilla." Now, Aquila or Priscilla and Aquila—they are longtime friends of Paul. So he's saying, "Hey, greet them. Greet the church that is in their house." So we understand that house churches were happening in Rome, right? So that is the way the churches would have been meeting. Uh, you know, whether they all came together at one point, we don't know, but we know that there were churches meeting in various houses, and that's how the, the body of believers were there at Rome. And so Paul's letter would have been read across all these house churches in Rome uh, to build them up and encourage them. Right. So this is a little background of uh, you know uh, the whole history there behind uh, 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 you know the people to whom Paul wrote and how they were came together in Paul's relationship to them. We we'll talk a little bit more uh, about um, how, how Paul wrote to the believers at uh, Rome. Now, about the book of Romans itself, right? Again, so this is like you're reading the back cover of the book or the introduction. Uh, what are some of the key things that we could uh, highlight about Romans? So one important thing is this, Romans explains to us very clearly what the gospel is. You know, um, th this is the gospel that you know, we are sinners. Christ died for us, rose, rose up again. Whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And it's the clearest uh, explanation of the gospel. We find that in Romans. Secondly, uh, Romans also, like I said, it, it starts from the very basic. It gives us a full spiritual journey, right? So like we said, uh, it starts off with the very existence of God, talks about the sinfulness of man, the consequences of sin, focuses on what Christ did for us on the cross, how we can be justified and receive righteousness through grace by faith, Okay, and then how do you overcome sin on the basis of the cross and through the work of the Spirit? That's Romans 8. And then how we live the Christian life, the rest of the chapters. So uh, it is a full map, road map from start on uh, to you know, a place of living the Christian life. It's a road map of you know, starting from existence of God to living the Christian life. So really you could actually, you know, if somebody reads Romans, they can actually get saved, learn how to overcome sin, and learn how to live the Christian life. It's like foundations, you know. It's a good journey uh, that Paul takes as somebody through. Then another important theme Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, is uh, the righteousness of God, the justness, the, the fact that God is just, that God is unblameable, God is righteous. And he deals, uh, he, it is one of those books that addresses this very thoroughly, the whole issue of righteousness. God is righteous. Even when he judges the sinner, he's still righteous. 
and in his righteousness, you know, um, he judged sin on the cross. And then he makes righteousness available to the person who believes. And the person who believes can walk in righteousness and live a righteous life. So the whole aspect of God's righteousness given to man and man being able to walk in righteousness is addressed in the book of Romans. Uh, probably like no other book. You, know, you don't find this kind of treatment of righteousness uh, in any other uh, episode. And one last thing that we want to highlight about the book of Romans before we start going into it is, like we said earlier, it is on, we probably find only in Romans, and these, this has to do with Romans chapters 9 through 11, uh, treatment of, uh, or an, uh, Paul addresses the relationship between Jews and Gentiles or Israel and the church. You know, what is God doing? And how, where do these two people, Israel and the church, where do they fit in what God is doing? And so in Romans chapters 9 through 11, Paul addresses that. Right? Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, you probably don't see this kind of treatment anywhere else um, in the New Testament of this whole subject of Jews and Gentiles. So that's a very interesting uh, part to study in the book of Romans. And I'm going to just cover a little bit more and then we will have some time for questions. Uh, so why did Paul write to the believers at Rome and what was his motivation? Uh, one, we can see that uh, he felt personally connected to the believers at Rome, even though he had not been there as yet. And even though he was not the one who started the church in Rome, most of the other epistles that Paul wrote, you know, that we see uh, Ephesians, Galatians, Thessalonians, uh, Philippians, other than Colossae, uh, other than the one to Colossians, most of the other epistles Paul wrote was, were written to people who he had direct contact with, churches that he had established, and so he felt a great sense of responsibility to them. But these two episodes, the one to the Colossians and one to the, Ro to the Rome, were to people that he did not directly minister to in the sense that he didn't go and start these churches. But he had influence on the people who were in leadership there. So for the church in Colossae, Paul had a strong relationship with Philemon. He had a strong relationship with Epaphras. And he had a, you know, he was the one who led uh, uh, um, Onesimus, Philemon's slave. He was the one who read, led him to the Lord. So Paul had a good relationship with key people from the church in Colossae. And so he could write to them. He had a great heart for them. Similarly, for the church in Rome, we know that he worked closely with Aquila and Priscilla. And um, so he probably felt connected to the believers at Rome through Aquila and Priscilla because they were uh, in some form of leadership uh, with the believers at Rome. And so uh, that heartfelt connection was there. And we can also see that Paul had been praying for these people, whether the believers in Colossae and uh, also the people in Rome, he had been praying about them. You know, he says, I've been praying that I want to come to, the, come to you and minister to you, you know, and uh, give you some spiritual gift. So he's been praying for them. And so that could be another, desire, uh, another important aspect of uh, his heart for the believers at Rome. And uh, lastly, uh, as we also mentioned, you know, he may have uh, had a desire to come and impart to them some spiritual gift. And we see this in Romans chapter one, and we will read that um, once we get into the first chapter, okay? So he had a desire to come in and impart to these believers at Rome and uh, minister to them. And perhaps some small lesser reasons was uh, why, why, why he was writing to them was, you know, maybe just to uh, let them know that, uh, he, that's his plan to come, prepare them for his visit, uh, to enjoy their company spiritually. And maybe he said, you know, I could be helped by you 
on my journey to Spain. So maybe he said, guys, you know, you can help me fulfill this mission that I have for Spain. So maybe the, these were some of the other uh, motivations there in writing. Okay. So let me pause here for now. And um, any, any thoughts? Let me just go back here to the meeting. Any thoughts, any questions, uh, any comments before we move forward? Any thoughts, any questions? All good? Everyone's with me so far? Okay, okay. Yes, sir. So, Okay, so this is just, uh, you know, just background information so we understand uh, what's happening. All right, so let me, okay, so I think everybody's following. Uh, right, so let's go back to where we were. Right. Uh, sorry, I need to share this. Okay, all right. So some things to keep in mind as we start reading from chapter one, going to the book of Romans is uh, there is divine inspiration, but we also see uh, human expression. So we know the Holy Spirit inspired scripture, but we also know that Paul himself was a scholar he was a Pharisee. That means he had been really trained in scripture. He had studied under the best Hebrew teachers, under Gamaliel. So Romans is very scholarly in nature. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, when you read it, it's like you're chewing on something really, really solid. Uh, it's uh, it's not um, uh, you know there's not too many like uh, stories or exhortation type of things. It's it's very scholarly. Uh, there's a lot of logic. There's a lot of reasoning uh, that we find uh, in almost every chapter through Romans, right? So uh, there's a very scholarly element to Romans. Uh, that we will see as we journey through it. Secondly, we also find that uh, there is a lot of reference to Old Testament scripture or Old Testament concepts in Romans. And this again is because Paul himself was an Old Testament, a scholar of the Old Testament scriptures. And so as he's writing here, of course, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is bringing out things from the Old Testament and, and, and making it, you know, helping us New Testament believers or you know, people who are on the other side of the cross understand the meaning of all of those things. And so you'll find a lot of language uh, references to Old Testament scripture in uh, the book of Romans. And Paul does that in, in many of his writings. And so um, uh, this is something very important. And then also uh, we need, of course, we need to keep in mind some of the local context, things that were happening, which we have mentioned, which is um, there is, uh, uh, you know, there are Jews and Gentiles in the, in the church at Rome, right? So there are, uh, Jewish believers who, of course, will be thinking of, okay, I've embraced Jesus, but what about Judaism and what about Israel? Then there are Gentile believers who come in and uh, who would want to know, okay, I'm embracing Jesus, but I have Jewish brothers and, you know, our brothers, brethren here. Uh, am I becoming part of Judaism or, you know, what is that whole relationship? So he's trying to, he has to address both people, people who are coming from different backgrounds and let help them understand the Christian faith and grow together in the Christian church. So that's another, that's the local context that Paul also has to address, right? And uh, lastly, uh, 
uh, something to keep in mind is this, that when Paul wrote Romans, and not just Romans, but you know, any of the letters that he wrote, or in fact, the entire scriptures, uh, they were not written in chapter and verse. But it was one letter Paul was writing. So as with every expression of thought, sometimes we say something initially in order to build up that thought later on. So what we must do is we must be forward looking and what we interpret in the beginning should be aligned to what is stated later on about the same thing. So for example, if Paul says something in chapter one, he introduces something, but he's gonna to continue to build on that say in chapter four or chapter five, and we'll, ex we'll give examples on this. Then how we interpret what he said in chapter one should stay aligned to what he has developed in chapter four and chapter five on the same thing. So that's the forward look. Also, the backward look is important, which is when the thought, when we are in chapter four and chapter five on the same thing, how we interpret chapter four and chapter five should stay aligned to how it was initially introduced in chapter one. Right. So that's the backward look. That means, you know, in order to correctly interpret things, we need to maintain a forward look and a backward look so that things are interpreted correctly, right? Otherwise, if you just read something in isolation and we are not, you know, we, we often say, read the context, you know, if you're not keeping the broad context of the entire letter, then it's easy to take something and, you know, misinterpret it. It is not aligned to the, uh, in, 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 to the initial introduction of that, thought, neither is it aligned to the future development of the thought. And so it is easy to misinterpret something when you take it in isolation, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to maintain the forward look and the backward look throughout uh, Paul's epistle. And we will, we will explain that, we will see examples uh, of that as we go along, okay? So in closing of this introduction, I know I have uh, just two minutes and then we have to stop for this session. You know, what can we expect from this study of Romans? Uh, first, we're gonna get a clear understanding of the gospel right? um, as how Paul develops that. We get a clear understanding of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Secondly, we're gonna receive truth that will really transform our lives, especially when he teaches us about grace, when he teaches us about righteousness, when he teaches us about the power of the cross, and when he teaches us about the work of the spirit, these are life, life transforming for us as believers. That when we understand that, our lives will be transformed, right? Uh, it is like, okay, there is doctrine, there is teaching, but this teaching that Paul gives to us in Romans is gonna change our lives. And that's the whole purpose of uh, the teaching of the truth, which is to bring about transformation. And that will happen to us as we go through Romans, right? And uh, lastly, we're going to experience, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit coming through his word because the Holy Spirit is the source of the scriptures. He's the inspiration behind the scriptures. And so obviously our lives are going to be transformed. Right? So as we go through the study, uh, apply it to yourself, uh, you know, uh, take time to just soak it into yourself. And then maybe, you know, uh, you may be leading a life group or you may be uh, ministering in church context, try to share some of these things. And, you know, one of the beautiful things is when you're able to explain something to somebody, it means you have understood it well. Right? And if you can make it very clear to somebody else, it means you understand it very clearly. So I would encourage you, you know, uh, to have a small group where you can discuss and explain it. And if you are able to explain it, it means you've understood it very well and it's uh, transforming your life and affecting 
your life. Okay, so let's pause here. That was uh, just uh, the um, introduction, and uh, and uh, so. Um, mm. Kiran, I didn't understand your comment that I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, are you asking where did where did Paul get the revelation? Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question that you've typed in the chat, Kiran. Sir, where uh, Paul uh, got all revelation and Paul wrote so many books and mm -hmm. so many clear uh, explanation in so clear. So, so how uh, the Paul received and Paul wrote all books, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So your, your question is where did Paul, you know, how, how did he, and, and how did he receive revelation? Uh, so we know that uh, the Lord Jesus revealed things to Paul. Yeah. So he mentions this for in, in, in quite a few places. For instance, in First Corinthians chapter eleven and verse twenty-three. First Corinthians eleven twenty-three. Paul says, "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you." You know. First Corinthians eleven twenty three. Now, of course, here he's talking about the Lord's Supper, but it's a clear indication to us that uh, Paul received uh, by revelation things he wrote. He again mentions this in uh, uh, Galatians chapter five, uh, sorry, Galatians chapter one, verses eleven and twelve. Galatians one. 11 and 12. Thank you, Roshan, for writing the scriptures there. Galatians 1, 11 and 12, he says, I make known to you the gospel, brethren, uh, which was preached by me. Uh, uh, by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is he's saying, you know, brothers, the gospel that I'm preaching and whatever I'm preaching, uh, I didn't receive it from some man. But he says, it came to me through what Jesus revealed to me. Right? So everything Paul wrote, he says, I didn't learn it from some man, but Jesus revealed to me and I wrote it. So that's very powerful. Now, of course, when Paul wrote it, he was a scholar himself, so you know he got, uh, the Lord would have worked through his uh, scholarly abilities. But the truth was what Jesus revealed to him, and Paul wrote it, you know, uh, with with his with the abilities God had given to him. So the answer is, you know, these things were revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And, and he refers that in many places. Also in Ephesians 3, he says, you know, uh, whatever we are preaching was revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, it's time for our break. Welcome. Uh, let's just take a quick break right now. Uh, 10 minutes break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. And we'll pick up and get into chapter 1. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. And, we'll, and please go for your break. Thank you. 